Once upon a time, there was an extraordinary land, an amazing place where dreams came true, but nightmares also abounded. It was a land of wealth the entire world looked to for escape and inspiration, but it was also a place where the eternal forces of good and evil battled and where many fell slain. High on a hill overlooking the land, a huge glowing cross stood lighting the way for all who would look to it. As time passed, however, few remembered why the cross was ever built or what it even stood for. Those who did remember fought bravely to keep its light from being extinguished. This is the story of that extraordinary cross, the brave heroes who battled to protect it, and those who have been inspired by its light for the past 100 years. The story of the Hollywood Cross begins long before it was ever built in the hills above Hollywood in 1923. For there would be no Hollywood Cross without the name Hollywood. Many stories abound how Hollywood got its name. That it was named after Christmas holly that grew throughout the Santa Monica Mountains and nearby hills. Or that it was taken from an Illinois estate named Hollywood. No proof exists to back up any of these claims. The only real evidence for the name's true origin comes from a page in the diary of a man named H.J. Whitley. Whitley was the owner of the original 480-acre tract of land that became Hollywood, which Whitley purchased for $22,000 in gold. In 1886, Whitley noted in his diary that one day he came across a Chinese man carrying wood in a horse-drawn wagon who spoke politely to him in a thick accent saying he was hauling wood to Whitley, it sounded like the man said, Hollywood. The name struck a chord with Whitley, and the rest is history. An honest businessman and a committed Christian in later life, H.J. Whitley was also instrumental in bringing the film industry to Hollywood. Although the California film industry began in 1909, when prolific East Coast filmmaker Colonel William Selig opened his Selig Polyscope Studios, in the Edendale district of downtown Los Angeles. Whitley helped create the first movie studio in Hollywood, the Nestor Film Company, that soon merged along with several other companies to form the Universal Film Manufacturing Company, a conglomerate that would one day become Universal Studios, the first and the oldest major film studio in Hollywood. For these accomplishments, and for many others, H.J. Whitley is now known as the father of Hollywood. In 1887, a Christian couple named Harvey and Data Wilcox purchased a 120-acre tract of land from Whitley, centered at what would one day become Hollywood and Vine. Harvey Wilcox officially established the name Hollywood when he recorded it on the land's deed in 1887. Harvey and Data Wilcox's original vision for Hollywood was to create a utopian Christian community and center for the arts a place free from the vices of alcohol, gambling, and prostitution. In 1902, Hollywood officially became a city. The first laws passed banned liquor, pool halls, bowling alleys, and even riding bicycles on the sidewalk. The LA Times described Hollywood in 1905 as a place where the saloon and its kindred evils are unknown. Soon, Hollywood was filled with churches from every major denomination, that had taken up Data Wilcox's offer of free land, and the faithful flocked to the area. In 1910, Hollywood's cherished dream of righteous independence came to an abrupt halt when its expanding water needs forced Hollywood's incorporation as a district into the city of Los Angeles and its corrupting influences. One believer drawn to Hollywood during that time was Christine Weatherall Stevenson, an heiress to the Pittsburgh paint fortune who became a patron of the arts in Hollywood. In 1919, she helped to found the Hollywood Bowl, contributing nearly one half the money, $21,000, to purchase the Bolton Canyon site, popularly known as Daisy Dell, on which the bowl sits. In 1921, Stevenson organized the first Hollywood Bowl Easter sunrise service, a tradition that continues to this day 
After a dispute with partners who wished to produce non-religious productions, Stevenson purchased a 29-acre tract of land across from the bowl. Shows at her new pilgrimage theater became an immediate hit with Los Angeles audiences. And her pilgrimage play, based on the life of Jesus, continued to be performed at the theater for the next 42 years. Then, in 1922, at the tender age of 44, Stevenson unexpectedly passed away. Grieving friends and supporters built a huge 40-foot lighted wooden cross on the hill next to the pilgrimage theater as a memorial to her in 1923. It is this monument that has come to be known as the Hollywood Cross. The original Hollywood Cross was constructed for $200 and lit by hundreds of incandescent light bulbs that outlined the structure. The lights were turned on during evening performances at the Pilgrimage Theater, and also for the annual Hollywood Bowl Easter Sunrise service. Sunday school children initially paid for the electricity. Then, Southern California Edison provided it free of charge. In 1941, the Pilgrimage Theater donated the cross and the land beneath it to the County of Los Angeles, which then provided routine maintenance. Later that year, just three months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor thrust America into World War II, Hitler partisans drew a huge Nazi swastika beneath the cross using bags of white lime. No suspects were ever caught. Following the war in 1949, a great worldwide phenomenon began in downtown Los Angeles in view of the Hollywood Cross when Reverend Billy Graham came to national prominence. His Los Angeles crusade lasted for eight weeks and was attended by 350,000 people. One of Graham's great themes was the Cross of Christ and its great significance to mankind. If you could have bought your way, or if you could have worked your way, or if you could have schemed your way to heaven, Jesus would have never gone to the cross. There is no other way of salvation except at the foot of the cross. And when I look at that cross, I see first the terribleness of sin. I know that I'm a sinner. When I look at Christ dying in my place on the cross and realize the things that I've done, and that it was my sins that nailed him there, I must cry out to God, Oh God, I am a sinner. And then the second thing I see is the amazing love of God. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You rebelled against God. You've sinned against God. You've done things that you know you shouldn't have done. You've helped even crucify Jesus. But in spite of it, God loves you. And on the cross there is written in gigantic letters in neon fire, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is the love of God. And if you have any doubt concerning the love of God, look at the cross. It was there that He died for us. In 1963, Billy Graham returned to Los Angeles, this time speaking to nearly one million people at the L.A. Coliseum. And the cross of Christ was always central to his message. It doesn't make any difference what race you come from, what your nationality background is, what state you live in, how rich or how poor, how educated or uneducated, you have to come to the cross. You say, but Billy, that's foolish. Do you mean to say I can't be accepted by God unless I come to the cross? That's right. And the Bible says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. God said you'd say it's foolish. You may be a PhD in the university. But if you're ever to have peace of soul with God, you'll have to come like a little child to the foot of the cross. The original wooden Hollywood cross stood tall on its hilltop until 1965, when it was suddenly destroyed in a Hollywood brush fire. The County of Los Angeles replaced the wooden cross with a more resilient steel and plexiglass structure that was illuminated from within by fluorescent lights. L.A. County involvement with the Hollywood Cross, however, came under fire in 1979 following a California State Supreme Court ruling that ended a 30-year tradition of lighting Los Angeles City Hall windows in the shape of a cross 
at Christmas and Easter. Citing that decision, activist attorneys sought an injunction to prevent public money from being spent on the Hollywood Cross. Caving to pressure, Los Angeles County pulled the plug on the cross, selling it later that year, along with its land, for $1,000 to the preservation group Hollywood Heritage. And the Bible says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. God said you'd say it's foolish. During that dark season, the cross was defaced and vandals sawed through several of its steel braces, sending it crashing to the ground in a 1984 Santa Ana windstorm. Just before the 1985 Hollywood Bowl Easter sunrise service, volunteers built a temporary 17-foot cross out of pieces from the old one. For nearly a decade, numerous attempts to permanently rebuild the cross failed, including a cross built out of balloons at an Easter sunrise service to draw attention to the missing landmark. The Hollywood Cross was resurrected in its present form in 1993, when High Adventure Ministries, a Simi Valley shortwave radio evangelism organization, donated $110,000 for its reconstruction. We saw the original cross sitting flat on the ground. It was bent. It had been weathered, rusted, and looked like it had been sitting there for a century. It was terrible, terrible shape. And uh, I would imagine that somebody went up there and got their metal saw up there and cut it and tipped it over like a, like a tree. And it fell flat on the ground, and that's where it laid for many, many years until they hired us to come and resurrect it. We then um, hired a structural engineer to go out there and make it stronger and design it so that it can stand back in place again, and this time we're going to try to make it uh, indestructible. Everybody took a field trip up to the cross, we all hiked up there and we all looked at it. We all had a game plan and we all decided, okay, we need to hire an engineer and an architect, figure out how we're gonna get this thing built and uh, stronger to, uh, to stand back up again. So we hired a fellow by the name of Dean White, who was the architect who drew up the plans and submitted for plan check, which we got the permit, permit for. Uh, once we got the permit, we started construction. We got a little static um, you know, after we got the building permit and after we got up there and started working on it, word got out that uh, we were going to resurrect the cross. There was a group of people that didn't like it. There were protesters that got involved, angry people. They didn't want us to build it. They let it be known that they didn't want us to do it. Um, we told them that if he didn't leave, we'd call the police because it's private property. And they left. Uh, we decided not to put the cross back where it originally was, where the original concrete footing was, because that would cost more money to remove the old footing. So we decided to place it to the side of it where we can dig a fresh hole in the ground for the footings, which was six foot by six foot by six foot. We dug that in, we laced it, reinforced it with steel. Um, we erected that steel out of the ground about eight feet, and then we were ready for inspection. So once we got the inspection, we scheduled the concrete pour, and um, the forms didn't hold, and the forms exploded, and all the concrete went rolling down the hill into the Ford Theater. Not once, twice. So that was a snafu. Anyways, once we were able to uh, reinforce, the because the footing stood up out of the ground by eight feet, and was full of concrete. So I had to get something to devise a way to make a strong form. And I ended up doing that with chains, three quarter inch chains wrapped around the whole thing like you'd see Houdini did back in the day. And that held it together and we were able to pour. So once the footing was poured, then we were able to strip the forms and um, prep the area for the cross. So during the time we we're working on, on the foundation of the, of the Hollywood cross, 15 or 20 feet of the whole lower section was wrapped in half inch steel plate. Machine bolt every three inches on the entire perimeter of all four corners, each direction, and welded. Once we got that thing done, then we got the helicopter, we had a Sikorsky out there. Um, we had a, the helicopter crew in the helicopter and we had a, a ground crew. Once the helicopter pulled that cross up off the ground and it was airborne, we had lines 
coming down from it, three or four lines. And once those lines got close to a man to grab, we would hold on to them and then pull as best we could it into place so that the helicopter pilot can drop it. Once we got it within inches of where it needed to be, tugging on it certain directions helped it along pretty good. As we navigated this cross into position and lowered it down, um, the sleeve of half-inch steel plate slid down over the footing, and once it slid down, they released it, and gravity holds it in place. So once the gravity held it in place, we went in and bolted it into the concrete around the whole perimeter. After that, we poured a four-foot circular concrete reinforcement around it, so it's encased. So you, you, you can't really get to the steel casing because it's covered in a foot of concrete. Somewhere along the line, they asked us to put in a, um, a time capsule, and there's a time capsule in there too. The rest of the cross was um, the existing framing stayed as is. And how we covered it was the actual sign company that came out. He went out and put fluorescent lights on the front face and the back face and then connected the ends with sheet metal so you would never see the framework of the existing cross. And then we, we uh, stuccoed the surface of that four foot diameter concrete encasement. And that was the finished product. I mean, it went through that, uh, that 94 quake and it's still standing. One member of the team that helped to guide the cross into position was the legendary Hollywood stuntman and circus high wire performer, Bob Yerkes. Immediately after construction was complete, a lawsuit was brought to have the cross removed. And I uh, managed to get it back up. And they took us to court for putting it up. And they said it was offensive. And I said, well, it's always offensive to atheists and vampires. And, uh, and it's just um, to complain because it was lit up inside. It said it was too bright. And the uh, judge says, well, maybe that's because of the darkness of your heart. He threw it out of court. No. Every time I drive by there and see it up, still, yeah, still up. It is this cross that stands high over Hollywood today. In 1997, ownership of the Hollywood cross and the quarter acre of land around it was transferred to the Church on the Way, a Van Nuys Pentecostal congregation that set up a perpetual endowment to care for the cross and to keep it lit into eternity. Having the sturdy new Hollywood cross on firm footing, however, didn't keep fresh attacks from coming. In 2004, activist attorneys and politicians conspired to remove the Hollywood cross from the Los Angeles County Seal, where it had been placed in 1957 above an image of the Hollywood Bowl. The revised 2004 Los Angeles County Seal eliminated the Hollywood cross, and a second revision in 2016 prompted by an activist judge's ruling, caused the cross over the San Fernando mission to be removed as well. God said you'd say it's foolish. Despite being attacked by vandals and Nazis, destroyed by fire and windstorms, and assaulted by lawyers, judges, and politicians, the Hollywood cross still stands high over Hollywood after 100 years. A light in the darkness, showing the way so all may see draw inspiration, and believe. You rebelled against God, you've sinned against God, you've done things that you know you shouldn't have done, you've helped even crucify Jesus. But in spite of it, God loves you. And on the cross there is written in gigantic letters in neon fire, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is the love of God. And if you have any doubt concerning the love of God, look at the cross. It was there that he died for us.